Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. A couple weeks back, a whole bunch of people sent me a story from Michigan. I said, Steve, did you see this? This one's crazy. It's crazy. And I didn't do the story yet because a lot of times as the story starts to unfold, I'll be watching it going, you know, I bet there's more news to come on that one. And if I do one too early, then I got to do a follow-up. And I'd rather just have it all be in one bite-sized video. So John sent me the update yesterday. I said, Steve, just see this. There's been an update in the story. And this is from Michigan. The story's out of the Battle Creek Inquirer. Trace Christensen wrote it. And Calhoun County Sheriff says, we were wrong after firing a deputy following an incident January 2nd in Springfield, Michigan. Springfield. So we're talking about an area in the southwest corner of the lower peninsula of Michigan over there by Battle Creek Kalamazoo, over that way. A Calhoun County Sheriff Department deputy has been fired after he arrested a man earlier this month while circulating petitions. So the man was going around circulating petitions, and someone called the cops on him. Now, here's the thing. People often call the police when they see somebody who looks suspicious. And then the police show up, and unfortunately, when the police show up, they often just escalate things because they're there. So when police show up and start asking somebody, what are you doing? Why are you here? Who are you? What's your name? Show us some ID, blah, blah, blah. What, 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 you know. If you're there lawfully, you're not breaking the law, people will actually go, why are you harassing me? So this spun out of control, but in a strange way. Sheriff Steve Hinckley said in a statement Friday afternoon that the deputy, who was not named, was fired following a review of the incident by the department's Office of Professional Standards. This is the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department. We hold ourselves to high standards of professionalism to the communities we protect. When we are right, we are right. When we are wrong, we admit we are wrong. On January 2nd, we were wrong. So you got to respect them for doing this. Now, I understand people are going to say, Steve, they ought to admit when they're wrong. But you know something? They never do. So when someone does it, you got to go, wow, that's cool. I I respect that on some level. It still shouldn't have happened. But... The fact that they're stepping up and saying, we did something wrong and we admit it, is a huge step in the right direction. It's a huge step on a long walk. LaRon Marshall, who is 44 years old, was arrested on a charge of resisting and obstructing police after two deputies approached him at the Wind Tree Apartments in Springfield, where he lives. So he lives there. And they approached him. And the complaint was, there's a man soliciting soliciting, and you see the word soliciting and solicitation over and over again. And this is a great example of idiocy in action. Someone called the police and either misused a word or the cops misused the word because the word that they used makes no sense in this context. So they approached him about possible solicitation. And that's kind of like saying we approached him about possible attempt. Attempt of what? Solicitation. Of what? So they approached him about possible solicitation. What he was doing was he was going around the apartment complex where he lived, knocking on doors and asking residents if they would sign a petition to create a tenants association. He thought it might be a good idea if the tenants in this apartment complex formed a tenants association. That's what he wanted to do. Ain't no law against that. Uh, One of the deputies questioned Marshall. Because someone complained about a man who was soliciting, which the deputy said was a violation if done without a permit. So apparently, the deputy thought, well, if you're going to solicit, you need a permit to solicit. (laughs) Uh, Hinckley said his own investigation, again, this is the sheriff, showed that Marshall was not soliciting, and that Springfield does not have a regulation requiring a permit to solicit. So the prosecutor, who has shown this incident with the police report and so on, dismissed the charges. But the charges that the police were seeking, a felony charge for resisting and obstructing police. And I have a lot of people say, Steve, you understand that there's an issue. When somebody's arrested for resisting arrest and nothing else, what were they being arrested for? If they didn't bother charging him with that also. So here, the man was charged with resisting and obstructing police. And it was a felony charge 
because he was said to be possibly soliciting without a permit. And there's no law requiring a permit to solicit, whatever that may be. And by the way, I'm, I'm making fun of it for a reason. We'll discuss it in a moment. So Marshall was arrested after he refused to provide the deputy with identification. So remember, the man's not driving the car. He's on foot walking around. And a police officer goes, let's see some ID. And he goes, no. So they arrested him and charged him with a felony. <laughs> I'm only laughing because it's idiotic. He spent the night in the Calhoun County Jail. Meanwhile, his two children who were with him. So there's a man and his two children going door to door going, would you like to sign a petition? So the, the, the police let the children go back to their home because they lived in that apartment complex. The sheriff says, transparency and honesty to our community is the foundation to all of our success. The conduct and actions in this case, in which Mr. Marshall was collecting signatures, does not represent our commitment to our community. The actions that Mr. Marshall took that day of circulating a petition are protected by our Constitution. And yes, they are. While some ordinances in communities prohibit vendors from selling items without a permit, no law, local, state, or federal, prohibited Mr. Marshall from exercising his constitutional rights on January 2nd. And as you can imagine, any law that did prohibit his constitutional rights would be unlawful on his face as being unconstitutional. Marshall said Friday afternoon, things need to change, and that is a start. I'm happy. It's messed up that he had to lose his job, but something has to happen. So he, he actually says, he's kind of sorry the guy lost his job, but then again, what he did was bizarre, referring to the sheriff's deputy who arrested this man for resisting and obstructing while attempting to solicit. <laughs> he did say he'd like to see the deputy charged with assault. And so the question is, if there's witnesses to what happened, did it look like the man was being assaulted by the deputy? And then he goes on to say, like I said, it's not enough, but it is a start. Uh, you have to root out all the bad apples for the fruit to prosper. Hinckley and the undersheriff uh, met with Marshall two weeks ago. We are reviewing procedure, policies, and training to ensure our community receives the best service from our departments, Hinckley said. So the man, again, was going door to door, knocking on doors, going, would you like to sign a petition? I'd like to start a, an association for the tenants of this apartment complex. Someone called the cops and go, hey, there's a guy going around and he's soliciting. He's soliciting. So um, I'm not sure if I got to tell you this. I'm not going to break out the dictionaries because the word solicit has got a raft of definitions. But in the law, solicitation in America generally means one of a few things. So we've talked about before about how England's got barristers and solicitors. Okay. And, and that's another form of the word solicit that creates the solicitor. And so in America, for instance, um, if an attorney is going out and trying to drum up business, that's referred to as solicitation, okay? And so an example of a forbidden form of solicitation is let's suppose I heard that there was someone in the hospital who'd been in a grievous accident. And I think, hey, you know, if I'm an attorney and I get that case, it'd be worth a lot of money. So I sneak into the hospital and I sneak into the person's room and just as they come out of anesthesia, they go, who are you? And I go, hey, I'm Steve Glato, I'm an attorney. Want to sue somebody? That'd be solicitation. Now, the bar and all the ethical rules that attorneys are forced to live by actually describes what an attorney can and cannot do to try to get business. But they want to avoid that kind of solicitation that makes attorneys look bad. We've all heard the phrase ambulance chasers. That's what solicitation leads to. So that's one thing. Solicitation also can refer to somebody who is going out and either seeking or offering to be a prostitute. So the question is, was this man knocking on doors saying, hey, do you want to sign a petition? Was he soliciting prostitution? I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, solicitation can also be to solicit someone to commit a crime. So we've all heard that, where an undercover cop posing as a criminal in, in an internet chat group has someone say, hey, I'll pay you money to go break the law. That's solicitation to commit a crime. That is also illegal. And then also you've heard the phrase solicitation for charity. So someone can come knock on your door, would you like to give money to Greenpeace? That is a solicitation. That's not illegal, but it ought to be. <laughs> I'm just joking. But people come knock on your door and ask for handouts. 
Do you, do you want to give some money to my charity? That's a solicitation for a charity. Again, not illegal. And then there is a thing, and it, it, it's enshrined in Michigan in the law called the Home Solicitation Sales Act, where someone comes to your home, generally, and offers to sell you something. And think of the vacuum cleaner salesperson who used to go door to door. You hear a knock on your door. You go, you open the door up, and there's a guy standing there with a vacuum cleaner. And he goes, hey, I don't care what brand vacuum cleaner you got. I got one right now that'll blow yours away, figuratively speaking. And it's inexpensive. And it's got a great guarantee. Let me let me demonstrate it. It'll take five minutes. Five minutes. Next thing you know, the guy's in your living room for an hour and a half. So there's a law in Michigan called the Home Solicitation Sales Act that protects you in a transaction like that because of the high pressure situation that you're in. Some people will sign anything to get that guy out of their living room. So that's where the three day thing comes from, where people know, know that there's situations where sometimes you got three days to cancel a contract. In Michigan, it's the Home Solicitation Sales Act, but home solicitation is not illegal. It's simply regulated. And so in that sense of a solicitor, we're thinking of a peddler, a peddler. In the old days, they talked about people who peddled their goods. And it simply meant somebody who's out literally by themselves trying to sell their stuff. They're peddling their stuff. So that's another form of solicitation. So when someone called the cops and goes, hey, there's a guy here who's soliciting. He's soliciting. And the cops walk up and go, dude, we think you're soliciting. Show us your ID. Is he soliciting as an attorney? No. Is he soliciting to commit prostitution? No. Is he soliciting to commit a crime? No. Is he soliciting for charity? No. <laughs> Is he soliciting for a Home Solicitation Sales Act transaction? No. So why do they keep using that word? I don't think that word means what you think it means. And that's one of the most annoying things. People love a phrase that sounds good. Conspiracy. Expectation of privacy. <laughs> I do not consent. You can say stuff because it sounds good if you're a poet. Poetry is where we listen to words that sound beautiful or sound interesting or intriguing or provoke our thoughts. But simply to go, there's a man here and he's soliciting. What's that mean? What do you think it means? What were they trying to tell the police? And that's the problem here. In reality, someone called the cops and said, there's a man here, I didn't recognize him, and he's knocking on doors. The police should have said, is he disturbing the peace? Or is he knocking on doors for legitimate reason? Did he knock on your door? And if he knocked on your door, what did he say? And if you said yes, he knocked on a door, asked me to sign a petition. When you said yes or no and, and, and acted upon that, did he then leave? Yes. Okay, has he come back? No. What did he do? He went next door. Okay, I'm really sorry, but you shouldn't have called 911 with that. You shouldn't have called 911. That's not why. I did a video a week ago. Dumb reasons people call 911. A guy knocked on my door, asked me to sign a petition. Can you please come and arrest him on a felony count and throw him in jail overnight? So there were mistakes made here. And the first mistake was made by the person who called the cops. Because you have to ask yourself, why are you calling the cops again? Were laws broken? There were no laws broken here until the cops showed up. And that's the irony of it. So unfortunately, and I simply mean this in the big picture of things, unfortunately, a man lost his job over this. I'm not saying he shouldn't have lost his job. I think he should have. But I, th I think that the police, if you want to step back or, or up or whatever angle you're looking at this from and take a big picture look at this, you want to look at this and go, someone calls the cops and goes, there's a guy knocking on doors. The correct response is, you don't send a cop out there. You ask the person, why are you calling us? <laughs> why are you calling us? So they need to train the people who take the calls to weed out the dumb ones. Because, unfortunately, when you send police into a situation, like I said at the top, you are often going to cause things to escalate by their mere presence. Because police don't always show up with the mindset that, hey, we're just here, we'll see what's going on, then we'll decide what we're going to do. Because pretty quickly, they're asking this guy for identification and arresting him on a felony count of resisting and obstructing, but they were called there because somebody said he was possibly 
soliciting. And like I said, soliciting is not the word that fits anything this man was doing. And so if someone calls the police and uses a big word like that and says, this man is soliciting, they should have said, soliciting what? Oh, a signature on a petition. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's perfectly legal. Did you know that? That's what you should have said. Didn't say it, though. So, um, unfortunately, a man did get fired. Another man spent the night in jail uh, and was hauled away, in, presumably in handcuffs, by the police in front of his children. And I have enough time to tell you a story. I did a, a, a trial a few years ago where a man was arrested uh, at the Woodward Dream Cruise. And the police had argued that my client had driven recklessly because he had driven around a police barricade. And there was a question about where the barricade was placed and whether or not the barricade was intended to keep it from going straight or turning down the side street. My client lived down that street. And when he went around the barricade, another cop came running after him. My client stopped, like, what are you doing? And they hauled him out of the car and they arrested him and put him in handcuffs in front of his kids. And we actually had a jury trial on that because that reckless driving, my friends, is a misdemeanor in Michigan, which entitles you to a jury. So we had a jury trial on that. And during my client's testimony, and I had him testify, he, he wanted to, and I, I let him. He's a great witness. And he described being arrested and put in handcuffs, held over the hood of his own car with his wife and kids in the car watching all this happen. And as he was describing it, I very discreetly looked at the jury and the jury was watching him, and they were pissed off. And they returned a not guilty verdict so fast in that case would blow your mind. And I'm not trying to explain whether or not what my guy had done was right or wrong, driving around the barricade. I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's up to the jury to decide. But if I had to guess, one of the motivations that my jury had to find my client not guilty was that the police had done that. Because generally speaking, if you ticket somebody, you hand them a ticket, they go home. And the question is, if my client drives around a barricade, is that reckless driving or is that something else? And so most people, I think, including the jurors, would say, write the man a ticket and tell him, dude, next time, honor the barricade and give him a ticket for going around a barricade. There's actually a ticket for that. And instead, by arresting him in front of his wife and kids in such a humiliating fashion that I'm convinced that the jury thought, you know, the cop went so far beyond the pale with what he did, I bet he was also wrong with the charge. So uh, very, very bizarre case back then. But, you know, we won, so it's good. But we were wrong. Calhoun County Sheriff admits it and fires the deputy after the January 2nd arrest of the Springfield man in Michigan, the Battle Creek Inquirer and a story. Trace Christensen wrote it. John said to me, thanks a lot. Questions or comments, put them below. I'll just talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Anyone who says money can't buy happiness doesn't know where to shop.